Mm. So before I go home today, anybody want to say anything? Anyone want to ask? Thank you so much for coming to Toronto. Uh, uh? We are so grateful you came to South India. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually it's very nice also to be here again. What I what I notice is that uh, in the life, you know, some things you the way that life is, you have to find the harmony at first, you know, what is meant to happen. No? Uh, because when we came, there was no clear. I didn't say, I'm coming to Tiru, we're going to have satsang. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. And then, OK, Tiru, we go. It's OK, my And then I, we came here again and looked. Then it's the old memories are coming back to maybe it's too big for for just a casual visit. And then it's happened. Now that it happened, we see it had to happen like that. With hindsight, we are all wise. With hindsight. What do you call Guruji this? Is this time to happen? Uh, yes, I would say like this. But you don't necessarily, that's what I was saying before, you're, you're not sure at first. But I'm okay with not being sure. You know, I, I don't like planning things. And little bit by little, one thing takes you another thing, another thing. But some people don't like that, they have too much impatience, they want to plan. So life allows you to plan, but it will never go as good as if it unfolds. But to unfold, you have to trust. To plan, you don't need to trust. You 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 go in, in your own power. But when you trust, you go in God power. <laughs> it's all like this. The people in the life, they are not, they don't have the. We don't give too much space uh, to trusting. They know you have to take life and you have to manipulate. Said, you can do it. Life permits you to try this. Uh, and even if you decide to. Manipulate, it is already in the destiny of the cosmos that this play will happen. You cannot surprise the Supreme. It's amazing, so beautiful. But when we trust that things happen, it's more beautiful. <laughs> I want an alarm clock like that. Alarm call, you won't sleep back until I sleep at night. <laughs> Very, very beautiful since yesterday, and since we are here in Tiru, there are two things that are um, echoing in my heart, and is that I, as a person, don't exist really, apart from an idea that sometimes is is from habit and from um, <clears throat> tendencies take a form, take a shape, but then. Thank you to your, to your grace and your pointings. You come back to this recognition that there's not really someone here, and only uh, the power of God is taking care of. And the other evening, I was bringing my Ima back to her place, and we were sharing some things about death. And then she said, "Yes, because even this breath is not mine. Even this breath is from from God." And, and, and today, during satsang again, I was, I was, um, from, from the heart was coming this 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 joy and this peace. 
and then uh, as I was in position and I saw some uh, some movements and, and some other things on the phone, uh, there's something that has this tendency to take again shape when I have to do something. When there's something to be done, is like this trust that you were also speaking five minutes ago, is not really completely here. Um, it, it, it only can happen that if, um, when, when something is to be done, then you say mm, the natural trust, the spontaneity, <coughs> uh, gets covered or is <coughs> covered, uh, because some identity comes. Yes. And the identity takes the shape of doing, fulfilling the task that needs to happen. But the task that needs to happen is just another action uh, that, 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 uh, that needs to happen. And uh, that, that action needs to happen through this body also. So it doesn't necessarily um, uh, mean that identity must come into it. The identity come into it just because of habit. To, you know, like this. Yeah. So, my point is that actions happen without identity anyway. The identity is like afterthought. It's like a pack. Is is I, I um, see because also yeah. after, it's enough to. I remember one thing that you once you said. Even the biggest waves of personhood mm -hmm. happens inside the awareness itself. Yes. And this is sufficient to again. Uh, the shape become again shapeless. Yes, is that when some? But this is, is something that I can like. Is something that happen after. I do the things, and then again there is this. But while I have to start doing, and while doing them, is like, mm -hmm. it's like my my. You you have something says it's like a pack that comes and says, okay, you have learned how to do things. It is from what you've learned, from your experience and uh, like past and uh, memory and like identities. Like mm -hmm. there, there is some something that comes in there. But that is being worked out. Even if it keeps happening and happening, the more you're conscious of that, the 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 less it's going to keep happening. Is it? Or you will say that you know uh, the identification with it uh, is weakening more and more. Maybe you don't notice it at first, but gradually it becomes more distant. That identity <coughs> takes responsibility or delivery for an action. It is happening gradually, because when we change, we don't really know. We just notice that we have changed. You know? That a certain way, even sometimes we speak about something and a change occurs, but you're not aware that a change has occurred until the next time you're going to do that action, you realize, whoa, that happened without identity. So it didn't change then, it changed earlier, but because in a familiar action, which is usually accompanied by identification, the identification didn't come. You think, whoa, if he's so much light, oh, it's happening gradually. And it's I put don't put emphasis so much on doing doing doing, or not doing not doing not doing, but on understanding. Because the understanding neutralizes the strength of the identity. And so actually, the the preceding activities are happening with less intrusion from the egoic identity, which is claiming responsibility or doership of them. It's gradual and sometimes very very subtle. It happened like that, and uh, the, at a certain point you begin to realize, because earlier we are thinking, I don't like this action, I don't like when this thing happened, and so on, so on, so on. But the one it's happening to, we don't, we don't put the attention on that one. We just want the happening to stop. But the happening is relating, is related to the one it happens to. So the one it happens to also itself is a happening. But we we think it is a fact that something happened to this one. So it is a sign of maturity that we come to see that the one that things keep happening to 
should be questioned. And then what happens is that if you catch that that one is the cause of all the happenings that's happening to it, and that it itself is a happening, then you know it releases you from the limitation of that identity, and you're in a bigger, in a greater field of consciousness. It makes sense, like this. Yes. We this last one we question. Actually, if we're paid attention to ourselves, you don't have to fix anybody. You just keep seeing that actually our actions and reactions, while we have identity, is very linked to our identity. Without identity, actions and reactions are the universes. With identity, actions and reactions belong to the present. So uh, it, it therefore is really important that when you are when your recognition, when your understanding comes to see that it's not about changing the world to suit your present state of identification, but when you are beyond identity altogether, then all things are flowing as a universal harmony. But it's the last thing we looked at, because when we are identified with personhood, there is some insecurity and a defence mechanism to protect the sense of vulnerability, which comes with identity. Without identity, there is no vulnerability. Everything comes back to identity. Identity, identity uh, creates some contraction in the universal consciousness, which then condenses down into something personal. It's like that. These are really. Um, <coughs> It may take even a time to really uh, understand and assimilate what that means. Then it will take more time to stabilize in that understanding and to become that understanding, so to speak. You know? First, the mind is seemingly trying to to take on that understanding. The awareness, which is the, which is the impersonal awareness itself, is already here. But the sense of the seeker, who is approaching the dissolution, or to uh, Swamiji is very busy. Man. <laughs> He threw me completely off there, right? <laughs> that is a test itself. <laughs> it still happens inside the awareness. Exactly. You're speaking such profound truth that the universal mind is saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> it could even be something like that. But um At some point, when it comes clear for you, that clear for us, that we the awareness does not need any help to work out personal complexities, because at present we may feel that there is greater strength and a greater sense of reality or belief in the state of personhood than in the source from which it comes. So, therefore, the source which is unchanging feels like it's a goal to be reached. But because it's infinite, there is no goal to be reached. It is you know, it is somehow containing all the shapes which come in and out of focus in itself. It causes them. We are a little bit like fishes dying of thirst in the ocean. Or the fish is being told, you know, you need to go, really, really have to go into the heart of the ocean to find real water. How do I get there? Swim. In what must I swim? Water. 
it, 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 when put it like that, when put away from ourselves, it seems easy and even funny to look. But when applied to ourselves because of the strength of personal identity, it just feels like, wow, that's just so difficult to get it, you know, because of the belief in the person, personal identity. So what is to be done? Just to keep sitting with it, and each time it come up, you know, because it does come. You don't have to go search for um, for something to, to inquire in. It keeps coming up. The eye, the eye sense is there. Uh, any thought activity, um, intuitively and spontaneously, contain a sense of I, who is the thinker of the thought, appearing to be the thinker of the thought, or the doer of the action. The I can arise silently. It is present. Then to be aware of this I quality. You know, is it personal or impersonal? It has to be personal because it is watched from someplace impersonal. Little things like that, just a little bit eye watching, you know? And then it makes it more mm, graspable. Otherwise, if it goes through the mind, it turns it into a huge puzzle. And it's like, you know, but like the lady said, but I can't do it. I can't do it, you see? Why does that feel so strong? Because the I that she's saying cannot do it is strongly believed in. And I said, the I, but that I doesn't exist. And so it creates some shock inside, like, whoa! So then what happened is that she couldn't find the I who can't do it. And that's why I started laughing, you see. Uh, I can't think that this is that's gone. That like this was happening, you see. Because everything is hinging on the strength and the belief in this I quality, who is unable to do something. I said, well, it doesn't exist. It only exists as a thought and as a thought believed in. Even the belief is a very powerful, one of our very powerful tools, because whatever you believe, you create. And then always something is happening to us, something is happening to us. And, and at the same time, I can see how plausible that is, how natural, because I'm not familiar, I'm not, I'm not mm, unfamiliar with that way of perceiving, because we all grew up in the, in the sense of the pseudo-subject, you know, that I, the person, am the subject of my experience. And so it, it's very normal, even considered to be natural, but it is not natural. It's just normal, normal behavior for consciousness. What compels consciousness to identify personally? Personally, <coughs> consciousness causes itself. No? The higher consciousness creates the gain out of uh, manifesting in as diversity, and to strengthen the play of that di- to intensify the play of diversity. For a while, many years ago, I have been saying. It is as though consciousness creates the sense of a problem in order to have the experience of transcending the problem it created. That it seems that life is a little bit like that. It's like a play of transcending, of um, waking one oneself up out of one's own dream. But for most people in the world, it sounds very abstracting, because we take um, who we think ourselves are who we think our, our family are, who we think the world is, to be what it is. And each one has a different viewpoint. Even someone's heaven will not be another person's heaven. Maybe they're hell for them. So at the level of personal projected um, you know, reality, we cannot meet. It's a, ma- a matrix of a tapestry of such diverse uh, projections and, and so on, even within the one unit of consciousness, is constantly diversifying its projections. Then, if you multiply that by eight billion times, how we can be one harmony? Only God is the harmony that appears to human being as confusion. Is it, it, the harmony that is never touched? And so great is the harmony that even seeming disharmony is part of the great harmony. 
So who can work it out? Nobody has to work it out. Once you solve the, the mystery of personal identity, your own consciousness is integrated in the, into the, the totality consciousness. And so it's more of a harmony than a doing. You're, the harmony is always here. The mind will play the role of disharmony, trying to become harmony. The, the ultimate delusion of the yogic experience of uh, two things becoming one. It's only play. It's only ever been one, like that. I don't always like to speak like this, because it's not easy to catch it. You know? Only as you begin to get familiar with, with the language of seeing, then you can then just hold on to this thread, and it will take you all, th- all the way through. But for most people, you have to start in a much uh, simpler way. And uh, they can also go much faster than somebody who's been on this path for a while. I spoke with someone very recent, just a few days ago, who has never done any satsang, don't know any spiritual words, nothing, very intelligent, what I would say, more emotionally heart-centered person. And it was a very big joy, because it's just talking about regular human relationship situations and crisis, where this person has had come into a, 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 a human situation, which, when he presented it, there is not really any easy answer out of it. And this can be multiplied many times. Sometimes, from a human perspective, we are in such a predicament, there is no simple answer out of it. The person is locked you know, into their own projection. And, and, and in such a crisis, that uh, if he did not have the strength, you know, some very strong ideas would come into your mind, like jump under a train or something, because you're left without any moves, only personally. And uh, in the meantime of talking, something here, just listening, because I couldn't find an... He was in his room, but I, in his house, but I couldn't find a door to enter his house. I was just listening through the wall, you know? Listening, and then at some point, a little hole there, and then I came through. Let's take a look at this thing. And just in that way, he came to discover himself in his universal consciousness, which he was not aware of before, but came into total seeing. I'm saying this because you don't have to have tradition of been practicing and satsang and so on. And the proof of it that anybody, anybody, even an atheist, if uh, somehow guided rightly and they are open, come to the same understanding of their universal consciousness. He could not believe it. He was holding his head. Wow, wow. Where was? Uh, where is all this suffering? Uh, whoa! You know, like it's, it's, it only exists on such a small plane. Then I told him also that uh, the storm would come. You don't come to this understanding, and you don't get, a, and your boat is not shaken. It will come from the mind. The power that is ke- keeps you in this body. Hmm? You can say it's God power keep you in this body too, but there's a sub power that is holding you captive in the state of personhood in this body, and uh, He's going to come. And you may look and think, why is this thing come to make me fail? But you can change your view and say, it's come here because this is a final test, maybe. It's going to shake the boat to see if you're going to jump over, or you'll stay at the helm and hold into what you see. You know? I know it will come. Especially, you know, he's a kind of newborn. So I want to see if you will be stillborn, or you'll be. Reborn. When you reborn, you can grow very quick in spiritual consciousness, no? or you can really get stifled. You see, by that. And I know enough people who came to seeing, and it was effectively stolen from them. But it's it's, it's inside their own uh, spiritual history of their their own spiritual um, destiny. You can say to experience like that, and. Uh, it's, it's like that. 
But my point is anybody can, you know, in spite of so many years, maybe lifetimes of conditioning, if you're rightly guided, you can come back to universal consciousness. But there must be within you some strong urge to, you know, like once you, you, you are free, to stay free, you know, in a way, to kind of stay free. Something has to work for it a bit, because um, the force that keeps us feeling bound is not just going to say bye, see you. No, it's going to stay there, and a few um, go through that. That's why, for most people, it's such a gradual, gradual, slowly getting a reacquired taste for your own being. Some few, one time, bang, it's, it's finished, you see. <coughs> Sri Ramana Maharshi, he had his near-death experience that came, maybe what you could say, out of a panic attack, actually. <coughs> and uh, so powerful was the recognition of uh, of what he was timelessly, that uh, the mind could not come back, it could not gather strength to come back. But he still had to grow inside the seeing, because he did not have uh, so much knowledge about it. He had direct experience, but not enough knowledge. He developed the knowledge about it later. The, the, the sadhus visiting him, the, they helped him with the knowledge to understand a bit more what is it is. But he had the direct experience first. And some people, they get the knowledge first, then they're looking for the experience. Some people get the experience, then they develop the knowledge of how to articulate if they are meant to share it with others. Some people, they had the experience, they can't share it. They don't, they don't know how. They can only be it, and their presence uh, can illumine uh, a, a sattvic mind very easily, but they don't. They're not given the ability to share um, through language. They can share through some darshan or something, but um, like this. The sense of um, identity. always has something personal about it. It's the first stain to be formed inside the consciousness, and it's the last one to go. The I-self, the I-shape. the I shape. If the I can become shapeless, it's free. But you must search to see if your I contains shape. When it touches shape, it comes into time. It comes into time, it comes into change. It comes to change, you come into life or death. But the shapeless one is also timeless. You'll find them all in yourself. So the evolution of consciousness is evolution from the I, the I me person, to the I, the formless I as consciousness. We are the I person relatively. You are the I awareness absolutely. But the, when the awareness has to become aware of itself, for a while it is sleeping in the form I am this body, I am the body mind, and the conditioning that arises there. And it can function like that because it is still consciousness, but it is very limited by its, um, uh, its attachment to shape brings fear also, because the form is subject to illness, injury, death. Uh, the consciousness is deathless. So when it ties itself to form, it's afraid also of it imagine it will also perish when the form perish. So the consciousness is in a way is strangled from its natural freedom. And it doesn't just vanish 
with a kind of intellectual understanding. Mm. It has to be <laughs> detoxed from the deep psychological, conceptual, uh, emotional beliefs and identity, which is totally possible because it is always the natural. It's always you are always. If you are not the natural, you will withstand no chance. Sometimes people say, "Why is it so difficult?" They say, "Because you're so great." <laughs> Because what we are is so great, and um, we have to taste this thing. We like it or not, we have to taste the, the, the field of duality and uh, the sense of contamination. First, we don't know we are contaminated, because the contamination can feel pretty normal. When you begin to realize there is contamination, you already begin to come out of it. When you're really in it, it's just norm. When you begin to see it, it's kind of wow, you know. Then I don't want. I don't want it. But you still identify with the one who doesn't want and want. It is just like it's it's a higher state than just blind identity. It's a higher state, but it's still a state of mm, a mixed state between a mixture of person and presence. This is why I said, in the life, we are accustomed that person, person is meeting person, person interact with person, almost always. Occasionally, when person meets presence, then a different dynamics is happening, because the presence will want to pull the person towards presence. Because it's a higher state and stronger, the person cannot pull presence to person. If there is going to be an interaction, the presence must raise the person. So from person meet person, then person meets uh, presence. And what happens when presence meet presence? Mm. What happens when presence meet absoluteness? Can absolute meet absolute? They are not two absolutes. No? I can give an example. Last month, uh, someone uh, I was in the very uh, I was in the presence, you know, feeling really deeply contented and happy. I came under attack by that person, but it, normally I would be affected because I normally would have taken it in the personal mode. But that day, I heard very strong remarks. But I was just uh, somehow it was, I was accepting no problem. Then the next day, the incident was over. Everything got. Uh, I wasn't really affected. But next day, I got identified with the, with the person, and then all the suffering came. I'm feeling badly, and uh, so now you're showing my error. I should stay only as presence, allow that to just pass. I mean. To really focus consciously on what I really am, yeah. and not drop back into personal identity, where then you take everything as a suffering or an attack or something. Like that. Even if that happens, that uh, somehow, mm, because if someone were to say something very badly about you, you are a living being, so it's it's going to have an impact, no? Mm. But at the same time, that impact is still felt from. It can also be be watched in a higher in a higher mm. consciousness. So the feeling is there, but it's not going to pull the, the the awareness into that shape that easily. It might be there a little, a little bit to create some some little. Um, no, it like a, it, the, the first the day it happened, I was okay. I didn't really get moved by uh, reacting. But the second day, when the incident was over, then my own mind came in and said, "See, you know, someone, uh, you know, this mental, this personal story came in." I have to be aware of not to allow that to. If you remain yeah. completely the same, the next day, you can not react. You don't have to follow that personal identification, which brings that suffering. The identity is what, uh, where it comes. The identity, it will happen. <laughs> Gradually, um, yeah. Mm-hmm.
Everything is natural, you know, at some point you'll find that um, there is really no interest in, you know, personhood and person play and person finger pointing. It's like it, it, it won't touch you. You will not even feel so much badly about it. It's just not, it's not about anything. Yeah? That's an indication of your you know, coming out of that realm, and then <coughs> subsequent realms also. Um, if I should say, I mean, our lives are primarily the evidence and the memory of the activity of the waking state. You don't have anything written in your autobiography about your sleep states. So it's effectively our life is measured in terms of the duration of the the waking state activity and the one who lives in that in that state. And at some point one recognizes that the the activity of the, the content of the waking state and the activity of the waking state, they are all one and there is not really interest in them, or the one who is experiencing them. But it's a gradual thing. It's not that, oh, I am determined not to be. No, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's like bled away. No, but it helps me understand why the way I should take the second thing, because I love my personal identity to tell its stories in my mind and make it stories in my It's very um, persistent. Because um, thoughts seem to spontaneously flow, and attention goes to them. If attention doesn't go to them, they don't proliferate. If the attention, you know, is watched, then it cannot, it cannot proliferate. No? And then the, the greater power stays in the weakness of the attention, and it nullifies everything. It doesn't go any further. When you, um, when the discovery, the true discovery of self, is a, a, a deepening, then the the real love come. The real love, the real love, can never change. It never change, and become hatred. It has never done that. All other so-called love is not really love. It's just sentimental fantasies. Uh, you can never unlove those you love. Even you may have fallout. It doesn't mean anything for you, because you realize that nothing, nothing at all, none of these things, they're not real actually. You see? They're not real. So this love that's in you, it may not take a particular kind of shape, but it will never change. It never turns to hatred. It will never choose to harm you or to harm anyone. But it is wise. And if space is needed, the space will be given. But it never turns. Those people who tell you, I love you, love you, and then I hate you, hate you, then it's not the true love. They never loved you. Don't know what it means. They don't love themselves also. And I don't say this as a big judgment, I'm just identifying. Love and yourself, they are synonymous. And just like this frangipani flower and the, and the tree, they, they, the flower and that smell, they go together. You know, it's not going to be that you pick this, this flower and it smells like banana. No, it smells like frangipani. So it's the same way. And uh, something is consistent, something becomes stable. Not because you're trying to be stable about anything, but that stability is just there. It is the presence of God. Your presence becomes the presence of God, not the presence of person. Presence of person you will transcend. Because the person is erratic, it's unstable. It is a state to be transcended. All states you transcend. This pure love comes when the self-realization happens. In some cases, the love also every every good quality can manifest 
sometimes you know in every being is manifest an aspect of god some something that didn't work for it's just there and uh, it can help to to raise up the, the the other qualities which are can be raised up but i don't even put so much attention on raising up other qualities but just of knowing who you are to so know who you are and then what is untrue will not sink you it won't sink you Love is also your nature, no? You don't have to learn to love. You don't have to learn to love. The love is just set free from ignorance. You don't have to learn to love. You don't have to learn to be peaceful. You don't have to learn to be natural. You don't have to learn to be eternal. You don't have to learn to be happy. You don't have to learn to be free. It's all there, just covered over a little bit, apparently. While we are in the state of duality and the state of personhood, we we are in the dream of of separation. So so these forces, they can play much more strongly. They play like that. But with true satsang, they are eroding. They are they are washing wash washing off. And one's true face is is coming. I mean, true. <coughs> your true face is timeless. Your holy presence is your face, and your countenance. Your presence is your countenance. Meaning, even without looking at your face, your presence. Is, uh, is is felt no? the presence, the love, the the natural acceptance, the freedom from judgment. Once the true love happens, all the negative qualities goes automatically. The negative qualities begin to be seen that they were never real. That's how they go. It's just part of dream. Some things appear to be negative, but they can be taken at another point to be positive. They may bring positive outcome. They appear negative, you know, and um, we can't really standardize or you know. Like one time, when a person went to see a, a saint, and this saint uh, threw stones at him. It doesn't seem like a very nice thing to do, but it changed something inside. No? Took some arrogance out. More than if he sat and was explained to him. You know? This clever boy, you probably mind. Uh, yeah? But he couldn't argue with the stones. A quick change. <laughs> uh, remember one story: one man used to come to satsang, and uh, he was always monkeying around, playing around, joke, uh, joking, fooling around with people. Then one day in satsang, he was a bit touched by something Papaji said, and. He said to Papaji, Papaji, how can I? My mind keeps coming back, and I want to be free. How can I be free permanently? So Papaji said to him, "You don't have to work at anything because uh, this life of yours, this life is not for freedom for you. You won't wake up in this life." Well, can you imagine the impact of that? No? <laughs> He completely changed. All the monkey business finished, and he attended to. I don't know what happened to him, but he changed. But sometimes the master appeared to lie on your before your saying. Don't worry, don't have to work too much because this life, 
you're not going to be free in this life. So you keep doing what you're doing. He could not accept it. No, 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 no. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Next. You like this, huh? Very strong thing to say to someone. Uh, don't worry, you are just the way you are because this life you will not be free. Another life, maybe try next time. <laughs> it's too much, then everything to change. If the Master had said, you know, what you have to do is you sit a bit longer and meditate a bit more. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do do it, I do it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I can do it for seven hours. And nothing come of it, is it? So, no, not for you. Uh, freedom is not for you, not this life. I don't know, maybe next or maybe some other life. So, don't try it, okay? Next student, talk to the next one. Can you imagine? Oh, 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 oh. The biggest blow you can receive. Of course, a true master would not tell you that seriously. Look, this life is not what we have. It's not right, no? but he knows how to get you to give full attention. <laughs> no, don't worry, it's not for you this time. No, no. Waste time chanting and all this is not for you. You know, just keep monkeying around. It's all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, we are talking about Amaya, one of the sisters who passed away when we were just after I left Rishikesh last year. And uh, over the years, when you are meeting so many people, to satsangs, you know, now and again you'll find somebody leave the body, somebody leave the body, like this, 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 not like that. Also in uh, Sahaja, just, uh, when was it, one day, one day before the start of the Sala retreat in Zima, one of our sisters passed away, but she was everywhere. You could feel everybody know her. You could feel her everywhere, her darshan, everywhere. And this powerful universal consciousness, everywhere. In a sense, we are also everywhere, even with this body. When we are freed from the prison of personal identity, or even becoming free, expanding beyond the small shape of personhood you are experiencing, the, the spaciousness of being and the, the edgeless self, unbound. This is really the, uh, the real opportunity of life. As long as the body is there and the senses are active and the mind, uh, yeah, you will have to walk through the playground of the, the body-mind. And it's always calling somehow. But uh, once you taste the nectar 
of the self, the other pleasures become much less for you. Get, get accustomed to, get used to the state of emptiness. It's a natural, no? Sometimes when the because it's unbound, because of its infiniteness, some fear comes to the mind because we are addicted to limitations. We even feel secure with limitations. Mm. And so sometimes the the infiniteness of the self is a feel scary inside, like you're going to be you you're going to be spread too thin it is all just the the, the play of uh, maya mind maya mind is also of god Sometimes I ask, I remember one time asking, just like I'm looking at you, and I ask, who is, who is looking out from behind those eyes? Who is looking from behind the eyes is who? And one man, he said, conditioning is looking out. I said, but what sees conditioning looking out? Then he collapsed. I cannot speak of it. Who is looking from the behind those eyes? I call these eyes the the lens of the absolute. When we are free of the personhood data and uh, sentiment. The nameless one looks. The nameless one is looking. The birthless one. The imperishable one. And his looking is his giving also. 